Hi, my name is James Hughes, and I would like to welcome you to the Convert Those CAD Details to Revit Assets presentation. ATG is a Platinum Level Autodesk software provider. A Platinum partner is someone who has the best customer service, best technical support, and best customer retention across authorized resellers. I would like to tell you just a little bit about myself. That's my head in the bottom right-hand corner that you see there. I'm a licensed architect in the state of Arkansas. I have 13 years of architectural experience, but for the past six years, I've been an AEC industry specialist with ATG. So my full-time job is helping architects, uh, interior designers, landscape architects, uh, and then somewhat engineers and contractors with their Autodesk software, as well as a number of other technical services. One of the services that I am providing currently as a part-time BIM manager uh, for hire is the conversion of AutoCAD details to Revit details. Most firms do not do the work necessary to convert details to Revit. They figure that it is a large investment of time. We're going to talk about why you should engage in the process and the best practices for conversion. Converting CAD details is a daunting and often thankless task that drags down even the best and brightest Revit minds. Don't waste precious time tackling this the wrong way. Don't put the task off hoping for extra time in your evenings. Learn and articulate the benefits and ROI that you can expect by doing what highly functioning firms do with their Revit details. On the left side, uh, this is uh, basically all of these images are from the early 80s. We've got uh, an early implementation of AutoCAD, a CGA monitor, a uh, digitizer tablet. She has a really cooking workstation for the uh, early to mid 80s there. Got a plotter uh, on the right. She probably had to handwrite the uh, PC3 file. <laughs> probably had to handwrite the, uh, the printer driver to make that print too back then. Uh, but what's interesting about this photo, notice that she has a board drafting drawing pinned up in front of her, and she is manually recreating that in AutoCAD. How pertinent is that for today, what we're talking about? And then uh, above that, you've got a picture of a five and a quarter inch floppy disk. I don't want to spook any of you that are um, as, as old as older or older than me, I'm 43, but if you have people in your firm that are under 30 years old, recognize that they have probably never seen a five and a quarter inch floppy drive uh, disc before. Uh, they've only seen images like this, or maybe they went to a nerdy museum and saw it. Uh, but this is AutoCAD 9 on disc. This is actually later when they actually had a logo uh, for AutoCAD. Uh, and then, of course, you've got Optimus Prime, because uh, I, I should have said transform those CAD details. Uh, but this is the process of taking something from the early 80s and transforming it or converting it to modern day. It wasn't long after AutoCAD drafting of converting these board drawings into AutoCAD that some smart people got together and said, you know what, it might actually be faster if we just draw this in AutoCAD. So I have years of experience helping firms with transforming their CAD details into Revit assets. In fact, I'm currently spending three days out of every one of my weeks converting CAD details for other companies. In a traditional firm setting, you would think we need James engaged on these important projects rather than having him do simple detail conversions. But I'm going to make the case to you that this work is actually the most important and most profitable way for you to engage your expertise to enhance your firm's position. Today, we will talk about the value of converting CAD details to Revit assets. We will definitely take heed of the many wrong ways to convert the details. We will learn the proper workflows for detail conversion. And lastly, we'll help you determine a plan of approach for the work that lies ahead. You can only see half of the table here because of how the image is cut, but here is what half of $50,000 looks like in ones. This gentleman wanted to create a YouTube video to see how high he could manually count money and how long it would take. And he found out that it takes him right around 24 hours to hand count $50,000 by hand. 
you are on a similar timer counting off dollars wasted whenever you engage in any of the practices over on the right side. Your numbers may vary. You may be really adept and it doesn't take you, if I wrote 30 minutes in there, it may take you less than that, but it is repeat. And there are other people in your firm that also are asking for help and re-engaging people and making it their problem as well. You would be surprised how quickly 24 hours, or should I say $50,000, goes by in a day-to-day -day inefficient design production. We're trying to turn this around and keep that pile of cash on the table. Imagine if you never had to go to a previous project or a manufacturer's website for details that still need to be cleaned up. Imagine if you needed to rework a detail that you could just simply select some of the incorrect components and simply change them in the type selector in Revit. Imagine that whenever you pointed a keynote at any of the elements in your intelligent detail, the keynote was already filled out. These are some of the values of approaching detail conversion as a serious game-changing endeavor to permanently improve the footing of your firm. This project is probably more valuable than your largest current project, and it should be approached, planned, and executed as such. So here's 10 wrong ways to execute detail conversion from CAD to Revit. By the way, I wanna take just a moment and uh, mention that if you guys have done some other wrong things or, or had some headaches and you've scanned the list and yours isn't on the list here, there's, there's probably more than 10, I only had room for 10, uh, place those in the chat so that you can share your uh, heartache with other people too, so that they're aware of some other dry holes or dead ends or wastes of time. Uh, inside of the chat. So we've got 10 wrong ways here. The first three mistakes are at the top because they cause, I think, the most headache. Ask any BIM manager and they will tell you that the damage caused by exploding an imported CAD asset is permanent unless you have some third-party software to help clean up the mess or at least partially clean up the mess. Also, nearly every user of Revit has incorrectly exploded a CAD asset. And the nuclear cloud on the left represents the fury of the BIM manager when they find out what's been done. If you spend, let's say, more than an hour on converting a CAD detail, I would say you're behind schedule and you need to sharpen up your process or you'll get overwhelmed and maybe not finish. Or if you do finish, you may cost the firm too much money and have a large block of, uh, and fail to have a large block of details converted in the allotted time. The most common mistake with regards to details is opening up old projects. Now, if you're a PM, if you're a project manager, you tend to keep your own cache of projects to yourself that you inefficiently search through and redeploy to your new projects. If you're not an experienced project manager, this is an even worse process because you won't know if the detail is correct, if it matches current conditions, or if it matches current project standards until you tie up minutes or maybe hours of more experience for a member's time. It's also wrong to take a CAD detail and to perform a simple line text and dimension conversion to it. We need to take this opportunity to leverage Revit for detail components and keynote information. If you find that you are linking in tens of CAD details because nobody has the time to convert them, you need to speak up in your firm about that table full of money that you just saw that's being wasted. Unfortunately, most firms have pasted in partially complete CAD conversion details. And this may have been work that you had an intern do, or it just may have been sloppy work. I'm sure many of you have wondered how filled regions with something.dwg made their way into your project or wondered why there are extra line types that have layer names prefixed on them. This is because someone didn't finish the conversion process and those exploded fragments found their way into your project. And believe me, they are going to cause corruption eventually. They've shortened the timeline for that corruption eventuality. The 10th wrong way that I've got listed here to convert Reddit details is to have an unstructured approach. For example, James can convert those in his spare time after hours. <laughs> my after hours work is precious to me. If you make me choose between my family and detail conversions, 
well, I'm going to let you down. Another unstructured approach would be this summer, we'll let the intern do this. It'll be good practice for them. They don't put rookies in charge of the explosive ordinance EOD teams. This is a job for some of your best, most fastidious Revit users. Let's talk about what we should be doing. Here's an EOD tech, and I'm looking in the chat here before I complete this. Nobody else had any other than the 10 uh, other dead ends or, or bad ways to do it. Uh, it's a good start. Just don't do those and you'll be happy. So here's an EOD tech working a problem in an explosion zone. When I convert CAD details to Revit details, I create a proxy project, basically an, an empty project to explode files in. And just so I don't get confused and think it's a customer's actual project or something that I need, I call mine explosionzone.rvt. Now you can name yours whatever you want, but I certainly know what happens in that file whenever I open it. I create explosion zone from my company's standard template so that it has all of the correct lines, text, dimensions, detail components, et cetera, that I need to convert. You don't want to start a blank project, you know, for an explosion zone using a default Revit template, or you won't have access to the correct anything. After creating explosion zone, I open the detail in AutoCAD, W block the detail that I need and note the scale of the detail. Then I switch over to Revit, create or duplicate the detail view, name it, set the scale, insert from CAD, and here's the tricky part, I partially explode it. After you do that, you can convert the text, you can add, unless you're going to be keynoting those objects, convert the line types, redo the dimensions, and then I, I realize I'm, I'm just rattling these off here, but it's a good list and it's good to have it, uh, have it documented here. Then you want to select and convert line types. You want to erase unused dimension text, arrowheads, or dimension lines. I want to identify which items are common enough to need conversion to detail components. At a bare minimum, I would say that you need to convert to detail components anywhere that you have gypsum board, studs, sheathing. Those are common detail components that come with out-of-the-box Revit installation. Then I'm going to create new detail components with multiple types. I'll show you that in just a little bit here. We're going to input keynote values for detail components. This is where you're really starting to bake in some intelligence into the details. And then finally, and this is critical, nothing is pasted over into a project or into a template until I carefully check all items in the type selector. When you copy and paste these fixed annotation assets into your Revit project, the benefit of it, of leaving it in explosion zone or copying it out of that, is that none of the explosion, let's call it shrapnel, follows along. The trick is you have to be careful, complete the work, and double check your results. This is the fastest way to convert details, well, manually. If you look around at your fellow employees and you aren't sure that you trust any of them to operate safely in the explosion zone, then you need to enable a safety protocol and have them trace over the linked CAD file, linked, not imported, uh, CAD file instead. It is more work, but it is safer. Lastly, visit ATG's YouTube page and watch a video by my colleague, Bruce, entitled, The Devil is in the Details in which he shows how you can use three different CTC tools to automate the process even more. I wanna show you guys some details in Revit that have had some good work done to them and to give you some ideas about what you can create with them. And hopefully it won't blow up on me like it did here uh, in the, oh, what was that movie? The Hurt Locker, that was it. <laughs> All right, so here is a sheet of details that I just completed actually just last week. And some of the detail work that's been done, I, I wanted to point out, uh, this came from an AutoCAD original, actually most of these, not every detail because this got reconfigured. They took some time to look at some of the details that served them well in the older days, but maybe some of them were site specific. They weren't common enough. 
or their older technology, you know, gates are heavier and we like to use larger hinges than, than what, maybe what we used to have. So some of those have been superseded, but it came from uh, this AutoCAD file. And I could zoom in on any of these. I just did them in order and I noted the scale here. Thankfully, they included that for me. Otherwise, you, know, you need to activate your uh, viewport and you would need to jot down the scale from there. And then each of these also exists in space. And they actually created uh, different grid templates for it so to help them kind of lay it in at the correct location. So basically you, you take, and I'm not going to walk through all these steps. There's plenty of videos that show this, but you select it, type in W block, name it, place it where you want and hit OK. And that's really all you have to do to take a block of a detail and get it ready to be inserted into Revit. Now, notice that I placed all of these details on a sheet. This is the best way for your team members to be able to see ones side by side, see how they interrelate. I mean, notice that these link to one another. They actually intelligently link. So if I move any of these to another sheet, it's going to up, it's going to leverage what Revit can do and update. I missed one here. I can see that too. <laughs> uh, and we can have several details linked to the same thing as well, which is great. So, you know, we've got several places where we're calling out that, that eight footing. So when they're on a sheet like this, you can compare them side by side. When you convert them, you also want to pay attention to your line weights. And so whenever I insert them into Revit, I actually leave the setting for, um, for keeping the same colors. A lot of people don't do that. They convert it to black. But with details only, I like to see the colors so that whenever I see red, you know, for, for in this case, red's their thin line. Um, I, I know even before I select it that that should be a thin line and that I've missed work because it's actually really easy to see which parts you have not converted uh, when they are showing in, in, in a color instead of in black line. Uh, all of these have had bits and pieces converted and had arrows manually repointed to them, but now that allows us flexibility in the future to move those items around. Some of these are dumb assets, like this is just a filled region for the concrete. So is this. And they have their line work is actually uh, built into the outline itself. And so we've got an invisible line here. Instead of putting in a break line, it just kind of fades off. And then our thick cut line around there. But you can take this a step further. And in fact, this firm has been overhauling some of their older Revit asset details and building in more intelligence by converting some of these uh, frequently duplicated items into being detail components. And for most people, their interaction with detail components is to only use the ones that come with Revit, but you can create your own. In fact, if I can do it quickly here, if I, if I can, I'll move on if I run into a roadblock, but this is just a filled region right now. But you know, we can see that this expansion joint is actually used in several places and so what that means is we, we've actually got the ability to create a family and insert it in these places instead that will give us some flexibility, let's say in its width and in its depth, as well as allowing us to be able to keynote it. And so if I wanted to do some work just to create a detail family for this, I just activated the view by double clicking it. I've already got the geometry created. So I can just go to file, new, family, and you can do this at, at any point. In fact, you'll go back and do it lots of times. And the one that you want to use, the family uh, profile or uh, fa family template you want to utilize is detail item. Line-based actually has this kind of stretching line. It sounds like you want line-based, but you actually just want detail item. You hit open and you're in the family editor. We're not going to do anything complicated in here. I mean, we're actually just taking, oops, had something extra open there. We're actually just taking a rectangle and recreating it here. Uh, actually, we'll do this rectangle or this filled region. You know, we'll, we'll leave this as a separate piece just to keep it real simple. So we just copy that filled region, come over here, we'll go to modify paste, do it live, what could go wrong? And then we can take this and MV move it 
that's our insertion point right there. If I wanted to give it some more intelligence, then I can actually take a minute and do some reference planes. Uh, I didn't, let me measure this real quick. So by default, it's about a one half inch, even though it's not exact, we just kind of eyeballed that. So we'll do a reference plane with a one quarter inch offset on the left and the right sides. And what's my depth here? By default, it's three and a half inch. We'll do a reference plane down with a three and a half inch offset. Whoops, that's up. I'll erase that in a second. Okay. You guys, I wasn't planning on getting into advanced uh, family build stuff here, but I uh, just wanted to kind of jump through a hoop or two here just to show you how you can spend a couple of minutes and build in some intelligence. I'm basically just dimensioning uh, this so that I can, uh, boy, this scales out of control. There, now I can see a little bit better. Take this, make it equally spaced. So if we increase the size, it will actually symmetrically increase. And then we can take this dimension and we'll create a new type parameter and we'll call it uh, thickness. It already knows it's a length parameter because I, I pre-selected a dimension and we'll, we'll use a type. You could do instance where each one's different, but with type, it allows us to save these out as you know a half inch expansion joint. Uh, and then I think for depth, I will make this one an instance based one just to give it a little bit more flexibility because you know each depth could be a little bit different here. So we'll change that to an instance, hit okay. And then we can save this guy out. Let's we'll call it ej.rfa. And we'll load it into our project. Oh, I needed to have a view activated here. Uh, let's put it in here. So if I go to annotate, I should it should still be loaded in. Let me check and hit component. Yeah, here's ej. then I can load this dude right here. And in fact, I would continue placing it around in any view now and use this piece instead of the others. Why? First, I can just stretch very easily now the depth that I need. I won't accidentally have the wrong width on it. That's two semi nice things. But also, and this is probably the most important part about it, if I select it and choose edit type, then I've got the ability to bake in the keynote value. Now your firm may not be using keynotes. Uh, about 40% of firms that I talk to are using keynotes. 100% of firms that I talk to should be using keynotes. You need to make your way into that space if you're not yet. But you've got the ability to point to the keynote value that you want to leverage and it will bake that into uh, your information here. So we'll go with uh, division 7,001. Now this is custom. This is just my silly, uh, silly text here. So water's bad. Let's try to keep it out. Hit apply and okay. And now anytime that I place this in a project uh, or in the template in this case, every project begins with a pre keynoted element that when you point to it with a keynote, it should fill itself out. Let's try that out. Oh, let me make sure that I did an element keynote. All right, point to it. Look at that, division 7001, water's bad, keep it out. Correct, accurate. <laughs> so there's a power in, in being able to input this in one place and then it gets reused, gosh, maybe 50 times in the project and all of it is key notable. So anytime you've got uh, an intern or someone who's just maybe not a project manager that you need help to keynote a project, all they have to do is point to it and it's going to say it exactly the way it should say it with the right timing and comedic effect there. So that's kind of the why go a step extra and build in intelligence. And I also showed you how to uh, be able to drop that into, in, and if you're not real comfortable in the family editor, I get it. I mean, I, I teach a lot of people how to do this. Uh, it's something that you need to move into though. I mean, gosh, Revit's 20 years old at this point. It's, it's time to learn how to do some of these uh, more intricate things because the way software is going, it's just going to get more intricate. It'll, it'll look less and less like architecture as we go along anyways. 
Uh, but this has got the ability to be reused thickness. You could set this to three quarter inch and then manually drag your depth now. And it took me uh, like, I don't know, what, two minutes to make that. Um, and, and you can watch the video and do it, you know, in less than five minutes. Here's another example of some intelligence that was built in. So, you know, they've got a, a parking space and they've got an accessible uh, space sign. And when they were marking this up for me to do work on, they said, oh, you know what, but some of our, uh, some of the places where we design, they've actually got a new ADA sign and I've been out of the game for six years. So I'm like new ADA sign. What is that? I mean, it's always been the guy precariously sitting on a part of a circle here. They're like, no, no, no. There's uh, there's one that looks kind of like an, an Olympic racing uh, handicap symbol, or I'm sorry, accessible symbol. And I hadn't seen it. And so they sent me a copy of that DWG. Well, then they said, we don't want to have separate details that we have to yank on or off the sheet or, you know, delete or for it. Ooh, is it possible that we could actually make it where you could choose which one you want? And I said, ah, now you're in my world. Yes, we can check this out. So we made it to where this is now a detail component, just like that one that I made for the uh, expansion joint a minute ago. But I created a parameter that's just a yes, no parameter that controls the visibility of it. And the beauty of that is you can se select this. Any of their team members can select this. Of course, you can reposition it too. And then the type selector, you change it from traditional symbol to the active symbol. And it just updates on the fly. I'm not redrawing any of that. I'm not, you know, trying to track down a JPEG and, you know, put it right over top of that. And it works on the sign as well. You just select it the one that you want out of the type selector and change it over to active symbol. And it keeps all of your attached dimensions because it's still going to the same element there, which is, you know, that's, anyhow, there's, that's just an idea of some of the, what you can do with the intelligence. Once these are detailed components and they act as family members that have, you know, built-in system parameters that allow you to control visibility or allow you to bake in keynoting data. That's kind of the two big things I've seen done with smartening up these details here. So just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a preview of that. I uh, also didn't want to um, you know, show you the whole process of you know, copying and pasting these into a drafting view. Uh, Bruce does a little bit of that if you wanna watch that, uh, that video after this one too. Uh, and then he shows you, you know, the manual way to do that, but then also how to leverage those CTC tools so that if you've got crummy line types or details, you can swap all of them out in like a couple of seconds, which is just phenomenal. I mean, it was a kind of a nightmare scenario to track down uh, CAD details and, and find out where rogue line weights were. Uh, you know, why is this text slightly smaller than that text? Oh, it's because it's 332nd instead of eight, eight, one eighth inch. You can use those CTC tools and make all of the text 332nd just swiftly, <laughs> no matter where it is in your explosion zone or, or however you're doing that conversion process. Okay, and I didn't see any questions in the uh, chat or the QA box. So I'm going to go ahead and move along to uh, kind of tying a little bit of a bow on things here. And, and if you guys have some thoughts about things that you've done that were bad or things that you've done that I haven't mentioned that were good, you know, please, uh, please share that in here. All right, so I'm gonna move back to uh, PowerPoint here. All right, so this picture is just in case you have team members that aren't ready to put on the bomb suit uh, and you, you maybe don't trust them, uh, then this is so that they can retrace those details instead. You would link those in and then you can draw on top of them. Um, so what are some of the steps that we need to do in order to develop our own plan for, for our own firm? Well, you wanna take stock of what details that you currently have that are in good order. I bet they could be made smarter. I bet they could be drawn a little bit better. And I bet you're going to find, unfortunately, some text dimension and line types that are crummy or some DWG hatch patterns and just weird stuff that didn't quite get followed through on. So you wanna clean that up and start with your most used details that you've already done the work to convert to Revit assets. Uh, let's see, I recommend that you place all similar details on a detail sheet. You guys just saw that in Revit. Uh, that makes it real easy for your team and for your experts to mark them up and say, no, 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 we need to, we need to make sure that we have a minimum 24-inch dimension that goes down to the ground. That's the new requirement. 
Uh, if you're in the 21st century and you're using a content management solution, you need to make sure to tag similar details with the same tag so that they cross reference and they show in your team members search analytics. Some of you guys have no idea what I'm talking about right now. Uh, if you don't know what a content management solution is, you need to look at Hive, H-I-V-E, or a competitor such as Avail or Unify immediately after this webinar. After you identify all of your current Revit detail assets, you need to visit each one and make sure that it was correctly and completely converted. If not, start with those. You need to identify your most used details and place them in your first phase as well. And while taking inventory of your existing details, you should note ones that are out of date or may need an expert to mark them up for changes. You should ask your team members to pool excellent details from previous employment if they hold the intellectual property of that detail. You'd be surprised how great details can come from other firms and great new ways of doing things can come from someone else's previous employment. After you have a priority listing of the details that you have and the ones that you still need, you should compare that list with the manpower and hours that can be made available to create a doable phased approach. Treat this as a paid project with team members having clear instruction on the order of the details to develop, the deadlines, and the expectations of quality. Have them do the work during company time as a paid project because if they don't do it, it will be a costlier paying project. I mentioned a content management solution just a minute ago. If your firm isn't ready to take that plunge, you still need to determine which details are used often enough to be contained in your Revit template and which ones need to go into what we call a container project, whose job is to store tens or maybe hundreds of detailed views. If you give this work to someone who is not excellent in Revit, you run the risk of having to redo all of the work or maybe uh, advise people not to use certain details that were done poorly. This is uh, commonly the outcome when the job is given to an intern to do. No offense if you're an intern and someone's asked you to learn how to do this well, uh, be, be careful in your approach. Ask if, you, if you've got questions. Lastly, consider getting a quote from a professional like ATG to have a person or a team of people convert details on a given deadline. Of course, I would say that. <laughs> but if your firm has had an initiative in the past to get the details converted, but you know, paid jobs keep getting in the way, just you know, recognize that there's a persistent resistance and that contracting the work will ensure that it's done professionally and timely. The cost savings is significant enough that contracting the work will still be attractive when considering the ROI. So just wrapping up uh, our presentation and demo, and I'm, I've got to a couple of uh, questions, both in the chat and the QA. I'll get to those in just a second. Um, so we have explored and articulated the value of converting a CAD detail to a Revit asset. We took heed of the wrong ways to convert. We learned the proper workflow for Revit detail conversion, and we determined and planned an approach for the work that lies ahead. Actually, I would add in, I, I sort of cast a vision for you know, how you can build some more intelligence into your details as well. Uh, if you only have one takeaway from this talk, I want you to direct your eyes over to the blue here. Your BIM manager will thank me for pointing this out. Never, ever, ever, et cetera, import CAD into your project and explode. You need to start planning today uh, how you're going to have your phased approach. So this, this does conclude the presentation part of the webinar, convert your CAD details to Revit assets. Uh, I'm going to take a look over into the chat now and, and answer some of these. If you've converted tens or hundreds of CAD details to Revit, please share with us your summarized thoughts in the chat. Uh, but like I said, at this time, I'm going to take a look and see if we've got any questions that have queued up. All right, can you give us the information and who is a good person to watch in doing the actual conversion of the details? 
Um, you know, I, again, I would refer to my colleague Bruce has a, and this is just like a week and a half ago, has a video that was posted to our YouTube page. I would recommend you subscribe to our YouTube page. There's like a lot of content on there. And it felt redundant one week later to, uh, you know, show you how to uh, link in a CAD file, explode it, and then fix some of, manually fix some of the uh, text line, et cetera. So I wanted to kind of focus more on uh, the the eventual end of building an intelligence. So Darren, I would look up uh, the devil is in the details is the name of that video on the ATG USA YouTube page. Uh, next question, best way to get the details from a file that they are living in into the active project. Um, so Ryan, there's kind of two things that you need to, um, I guess, realize about this. It is either a detail that is almost certain to be used in a project. In that case, the detail belongs inside of your Revit project template. That means that it's already there. It's probably already placed on a sheet inside of your project. A lot of firms will overpopulate their details and simply delete out sheets or delete out details that they don't want. Uh, that's one way to do it unless you've just got hundreds and hundreds. So Ryan, if you do have uh, quite a few details and they are in a container project, which is what you do if you don't have a content management solution, from a container project, uh, the best way to do that would uh, be to create the uh, drafting views inside of Revit. Or actually, you can, um, you can create a new view uh, from, from a uh, different project as well. Let me fumble through this. It's been a little bit since I've done that here. Uh, not a plan view. Uh, it's insert, that's where it is insert from file, insert views from file. So you would browse to that Revit project uh, that you want to grab them from, uh, and then you can insert them uh, in that manner. And the reason I'm so crusty at, at doing things that way is because uh, since content management solutions have come out, uh, for me, the best way to do it is to open up Hive, type in, you know, K through 12 roofing details, you know, for school roofing, if we're doing an EPDM roof, I might just type in EPDM roof detail. And it might pull up 10 that maybe originally came from the manufacturer, but we've sort of, uh, you know, polished them up a bit. With that, you can just right click on it and open it in file, or actually you can just double click it, and it will create a view from Hive into your project. So that is definitely the, the Cadillac way to do that, uh, Ryan, to answer that question. Uh, Brock says, can't find CTC YouTube video on detail conversion process. Um, so Brock, if you Google search ATG, I'm sorry, YouTube, ATG USA, devil is in the details, you should be able to find that. If not, you can just Google that first part, YouTube, ATGUSA.com, uh, not .com, ATGUSA, and then that will take you to our page and you should be able to browse through the videos and see it. I think there's like a thumbnail of like fire. Uh, on the thumbnail if you're kind of browsing through other videos. All right, uh, let's see, I've got a couple more open questions. Where and when can the designing safe office spaces recording be acquired? Um, Brent, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that all of our content that comes out from webinars that ATG uh, creates is on that same page that I was just uh, mentioning to Brock. If you Google search ATG USA, uh, then you should find access to all of our videos um, that, that come out. Uh, there's typically just a few days that happen before they get posted uh, onto that, that page. Uh, Lucas says, if we have typical wall types, say a double width wall, would you recommend creating a component for the assembly versus a detail group that is arrayed vertically? Ooh. Um. If you are, uh, Lucas, if you are going to use keynotes to refer to it, then, um, then I think that I would create it as a detail group just so that it has, I'm sorry, as a uh, detail component, just so that it has that keynote value uh, that you can point to. Uh, if you're not going to, I mean, you could just use a repeating detail if you wanted to, 
uh, but you can't even snap a line to that. So there's, there's actually lots of ways to do it. I actually just saw a new way uh, to do it as well, where they created a partition diagram um, with you know the text and pointing out what each layers were. And then they grouped that and they did that with their uh, 20 most common wall types. And then they've already got them laid out on a sheet. And when they want to change, you know, W1 for W5, they just click on it, change it in the type selector, and it changes the entire uh, wall type out. It, it's something you'd have to see, but I, I can't bring it up on screen or I you know, don't want to show customers a thing. It's just, it's just something to think about. Uh, Richard says, do you recommend tools to automate the process? I, I do. If you've got, let's say, more than... If you've got more than two sheets worth of, of doing it, uh, there, it's probably going to be worth taking a look at the CTC tools. Uh, there, you know, Bruce shows you a few of them. Uh, there's um, Type Swapper is probably the biggest deal in that, and it's in the BIM Manager suite. Uh, there's also one for Quick Select, which is actually a free tool. So if you wanted to download BIM Project Suite, you could try using Quick Select, and Bruce shows you how to use that to reach through your project and grab all of, you know, a particular offending line type and then, you know, delete it or change it in one move. All right. Uh, a couple more just popped in. Wow. So this is a great conversation we're having here. Uh, Jose says, I usually create and have a separate Revit project to transfer or import clean up and convert CAD files to Revit. Jose, we're talking about the same thing, man. I, I just happen to call mine explosion zone or, or a proxy project. So you do it in a safe project. And like I mentioned before, never, ever, ever explode that stuff in your actual project. And if you work for the firm I work for and you do it in the template, I am probably going to punch you in the throat <laughs> because you're basically ensuring that all future projects are going to have a shortened timeline towards corruption for several years if you do if you make that one mistake uh, it's a big deal uh, let's see luke says is downloading ctc bim project suite required in order to use the detail link uh, i think detail link is let me pull it up real quick here do i happen to have uh ctc software tools here uh detail link i think is where are you Oh, it's over here. So Detail Link and Quick Select are two free tools. You can tell because they're that light green color in the CTC BIM Project Suite. Uh, and so Luke, yeah, you would need to download the CTC BIM Project Suite. It's got, uh, I think, a 14-day free trial. And, and that lets you use all these dark green tools as well. So you want to test those and see if there's value in them. But I mean, perpetually, you get to use, well, that's probably a legal term I shouldn't use. You get to keep using Quick Select and Project Link, uh, I want to say thereafter, uh, after that 14 days. <laughs> Take that as unlegally as a description as you can. All right. Well, I finally uh, caught up to all of the questions uh, that, that we had in the, uh, in the chat. So uh, I do appreciate those, uh, a lot more interaction here. I hope that this discussion has motivated you guys to begin the process. You will need a plan. Uh, that's usually how these things break down. Every, every firm that we've helped build details for, they didn't really have a plan. They were counting on their Revit Jedi to pull it out in their free time. Honestly, that, that is the most common stance that companies have. And then six months go by and it's not done. And then they don't want to ask about it. And then there's just no plan and we don't talk about it. <laughs> so we've shown how, uh, how are you, shown how you can do it and why to do it. And we've talked a little bit about the ROI. Now, obviously I, I can't just throw around numbers and have them actually apply to you. Uh, but hopefully I've shown you how you can't afford to not do it. When you guys saw, you know, that waste of time that you're seeing whenever firms go to previous projects or they pull up, uh, you know, old details and have to rework them. Here is a picture of $10,000 just in case you need a visual aid on what a down payment on that mistake would cost. I'm James Hughes. Remember, if you explode an imported CAD detail into any project of mine, I will make you regret it. Until next time, goodbye.